Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the National Capital Bible Church for our Bible class. And uh, for those online, we have the chat box open. We're going to try something different. So if you'd like to ask a question, you can put it in the chat box and one of us will see it and we'll try to address it. But for now, let's pause for a moment of silence using 1 John 1 9 so that we could be prepared spiritually speaking. And I'll open in prayer in just a moment. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity to examine your word this evening. If there is anything bothering us or vying for our attention, I pray that we would be disciplined enough to lay those aside so that we can focus on thee, focus on thy word. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we are on page 92 on uh, Basic Training Field Manual. So if you have your books, 92. What we're going to do is we're going to read, I'm going to read the several points. He's got, I think, five points here. I'm just going to read that, kind of summarize it, and then I'm going to take you through what I came up with with regards to salvation. So we're going to compare and contrast the free grace position and the reform position in the areas of salvation, namely justification, sanctification, and glorification. We're going to see the differences. I know most of us are familiar with this, but um, we're going to have this on recording because I think this is important to know. The way of salvation. He starts off with number one, page 92, the need of mankind, the need of mankind. He says, the Bible teaches that all men are born in Adam, that's positionally speaking, under condemnation of his sin. So because he sinned, we are all sinners as well. You find this in Romans 5, 12, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Because all men are born with the sin nature, Psalm 51, 5, all have sinned against God. And that's the problem there. We have a sin nature and because of that sin nature, we tend to sin. We sin because we're a sinner. We sin because of our nature. It's our nature to sin. All have sinned against God, Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death. Not only do we experience spiritual death, but physical death as well. All that came about as a result of sin. The penalty of sin, Adam's sin is first spiritual death, meaning spiritual separation from God, which is why we, can, we saw in Genesis <clears throat> the opening of their eyes. So in a sense, they became like God, knowing right from wrong. And so that is part of the spiritual death that Genesis speaks of. The pen penalty of Adam's sin is spiritual death, Genesis 2.17, Romans 5.12, followed by physical death. So notice the order, spiritual death, physical death. We were never intended to die at in the beginning, but because of sin, we now die. Because we are born in Adam, and that preposition in is always important, it means it speaks of position, our position in Adam, we're born under condemnation from God. So number two, point number two, he talks about the provision of God's love. So this is the answer, God's love. As creator, God loves his creation. However, his love cannot overrule his righteousness and justice, as found in Psalms 89, 14. Therefore, God, in love, sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take our place to be judged on the cross. To remove the penalty for our sins, we see this in John 3, 16, Ephesians 2, 4 to 8, and Romans 5, 8. On the cross, Jesus became what's called our substitute, substitutionary death. He became our substitute, bore our penalty, and removed our condemnation. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, 1 Peter 2, 24, Isaiah 53, 4 to 6. And when the penalty for sins were paid, he cried out, it is finished, to telestai, right? John 19, 30. He had satisfied God's righteousness in his life, Jesus Christ, and his justice in his death. He rose from the dead. Romans 8, 33 to 35. 
So now I'm just going to read the points now. I'm not going to read everything. You can read that on your, on your own. The gift must be what? Received. What's another word for received? Believed. Turn to John chapter 1, verse 12. It defines what it means in John chapter 1, verse 12. These people make a big deal out of receiving Jesus, and it is a big deal, but let's let the Gospel of John define what it means, help us understand what it means. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who what? To those who believe in his name. So you can see the believe parallels received. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So that's the gift that must be received. Point number three. The gift of God, eternal life, is a gift. The only way the gift can be received is by faith in Jesus Christ. Again, it's believing in Christ. So the gift must be received, and that gift is received at the moment of faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, upon faith in Christ. Number four, he talks about the assurance of eternal security. What's that mean? Once saved, always saved. What else is in a, how's, how else can we say this? The assurance of eternal security. And if there's anybody texting anything, Bill, just... Okay, good. The assurance of eternal security. Maybe another way is, you must know that you're saved. How about that? Why? Because Jesus told us he who believes in me has everlasting life. Can we trust him? Can we take that to the bank? I would say yes. So if he says you have everlasting life, eternal life, who are we to question that? So I think that's where Gene is going with this. The assurance of eternal security. We must know that Jesus Christ, when he says what he says, you can have assurance of everlasting life by believing in his promise. But here it's particular the assurance of eternal security. What's that mean? No matter how many times you blunder, you're still what? You're still saved. So you have to believe in eternal security because if you don't, you're not believing in Christ. Because everlasting life will last how long? For all eternity. So if you don't believe in the assurance of eternal security, then in essence, you don't believe in what Jesus promised. When he says you have everlasting life, that means it's for ever. So the assurance of eternal security, the work of salvation is a once for all gift. This is his definition now. This is what he says. The work of salvation is a once for all gift. Jesus said that once we are cleansed before God, we, never, we need not what? Repeat it. We don't have to go to Christ again because once saved, always saved, once eternally saved, always eternally saved. We don't lose that. In fact, Romans, what is it? Romans 11.29 reminds us. <clears throat> make sure this is the verse I'm looking for. Maybe that's not it. Bill, can you read 11.29? Yes. <clears throat> Romans 11.29. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Is, is salvation a gift? So salvation is irrevo irrevocable. You can't revoke it. Romans 11.29, right? The gifts and the calling. If he calls you, if he gives you a gift of salvation, it's irrevocable. Irrevocable. You can't lose that. You, God can't undo it. You cannot lose a call. You cannot lose a gift. He gives you both. You have salvation. You can't lose it. Why? Because it's a gift. God says in Romans eleven twenty nine, it's irrevocable. Some of us have irrevocable trust. You can't lose it. 
unless there's a crash. But technically, it's secure. You cannot lose it. It's irrevocable. That's why it's an irrevocable trust. So the assurance of eternal security is rooted in the promise of the Son of God, second person of the Trinity. We should have assurance. That's important because sometimes we blunder. Sometimes we fall short. Sometimes we fail God. Sometimes we break those promises. But those do not revoke eternal security. We should have the assurance of eternal security because it doesn't depend on our behavior. It depends on His behavior, which He said on the cross, what? It is finished. So if Jesus says it's finished, there's nothing you can do. You can't improve upon it. You can't make it better. You can't even make it more sure because it's as sure as can be. It's finalized. It is finished. What is finished? The cross work. It has been secured on the cross. Tetelestai. It is finished. That's why other systems, other religions, they think you must do this, you must do that. You have to be a better person. Should we be a better person? Of course we should. But that doesn't contribute to our eternal security, our salvation. It doesn't change that at all. In fact, we're going to see in just a moment, as I mentioned a year and a half ago, two years when we talked about discipleship and soteriology, Dwight Pentecost in his book, Oh, here it is. No wonder why. It's eternally secure up here. Designed for discipleship. You'll recall I read his forward two years ago. You remember what it said? And it's true today. Even though this was written in 1996, I used this for discipleship at Chafer. He said in his forward, discipleship is frequently equated with salvation and often erroneously made a condition for becoming a Christian. Thus, many are confused about their relationship to Jesus Christ. That's Dr. Dwight Pentecost. Mike, did you ever, ever have to use his book? It's a good book. Real simple on discipleship, but it was something we needed to read for our class. And he was the one who wrote um, the book that we talked about Sunday, Things to Come, The Kingdoms. He wrote that. So assurance of eternal security, that was point number four. And number five, the new creation in Christ. We all become a new creation positionally in Christ. Outside of Christ, you're still the old loser. You're eternally lost forever. You're still in Adam. We're trying to be, get people into Christ, who is called what? The second Adam. So now it's location. Are you, in few, are you in Christ? Are you in Adam? Are you still in Adam? Or are you now in Christ? Yesterday, I had the privilege of leading another lady to Christ. She is from a... Filipino system, a Roman Catholic system, not, nothing wrong with Roman Catholicism, but the truth is she was Roman Catholic, and uh, I shared the gospel with her, and she, at first she thought, is any, everything okay? Because I asked if I could talk to her, because she works behind this desk up in the front. And I said, do you have a few minutes? And she said, um, she looked at me kind of funny, like, why? I said, just for a few minutes. So I was able to get her to come to the front where there's these... Uh, I think they're like couches in the front, you know, when you enter the door. And I said, um, so-and-so, you know, I said, I, I probably won't be here much longer. And I'm just trying to say my hellos and um, let people know what I do. And I said, I don't know if you know what I do. And she said, oh, yeah, the, the lady up here told me that you're a, a minister. I said, yeah, that's true. And I, she said, is everything okay? I said, yeah, um, I just want you to know. And I took out my phone. And I, um, knowing that I was going to talk to her in advance, I 
copy and pasted the John 3.16 on my notes, and then I put her name in, in places where it says, for God so loved the world. I put her name. That he gave his only begotten son, that if name will not will believe, she, you will not perish. And so I went in and started to describe this. And she said, oh, I'm, I'm Catholic. I said, oh, that's good. Then you already know what he did on the cross. And she said, uh, yeah. She said, and she smiled and she said, yeah. And you're on a mission. I said, yes, I am on a mission. I'm wanting people to believe in Christ because he said he who believes in me has everlasting life. And I said, now, if you do that by faith, trusting in him, according to him, you have everlasting life. And I said, you know, I know you probably don't, won't understand all the details now, but if by faith you believe in what he has done, especially knowing what he has done for you, then by virtue of what he promises, by faith, you will have everlasting life. And she said, oh, that's, she said, that's, that's, pr- that's, pr- I think she, her word was, that's beautiful. I said, yeah, so do you, do you believe that? She said, yeah, I, I do. Faith, right? I said, yes, faith. I said, well, then you're, you're good. You are, the Bible says you have everlasting life. And I said, like I said, uh, I'll come around. I'm still here for a little while. And I said, I can explain some of this more in detail. I might even be able to bring something for you. So to read. I said, oh, thank you. You're so kind. And I said, well, that's fantastic. And I, and I realized that when, you, when I present things like this, sometimes they won't know all the details. But it's kind of the same way in the scripture. When Jesus talks to people, he, they don't always know every detail about what he just revealed. And I said, so we just have to take it by faith that when they respond to his promise, and it's up to Christ to do what he says he would do. So it's up to him. And I, to me, it's, that's already a step in the right direction. So now, second time around, I can always talk to her some more and give her something so she can study. But that's always the goal is to get them to hear what Jesus says and then acquiesce to him. So anyways, that is something that uh, I believe she became a new creature in Christ, as point number five says. At the moment of salvation, we become a new creature in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17. There are five divine works uh, that achieve this, baptism of the Spirit, regeneration, indwelling of the Spirit, spiritual gifting, sealing ministry of God's Spirit. So, again, I, I thought Pastor Gene did a great job, so there's no need to go into all of this because you have the book in front of you or uh, at your disposal, so you can always read this. Now, I'm excited to get into this presentation because we're going to compare the free grace position and reform perspectives on salvation. But before I do... Does anybody have any thoughts or comments based on what we've just read? Okay. Well, then let me just proceed then. This shouldn't take too long, but it it might get you all to think and be able to say, oh, this is why it's important. So I want you to think about salvation. What comes to mind? We think of being born again. We think of believing in Jesus and so on and so forth. Very good. There are two Two perspectives that are very popular today. You have the free grace position and the reform perspective on salvation. Reform is usually linked to lordship salvation or even a religious system that equates good behavior with salvation itself. So you must do this, you must change, you should live a certain way, otherwise you're proving what? You're not really saved because if you're truly regenerate, in fact, they take what this verse that we've just read, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, they'll say, Bill, can you read 2 Corinthians 5, 17? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old thing is passed away, the old thing is passed away. Okay, old things have passed and new things have come. So if you're truly saved, you're a new create creature or creation, then you should not be struggling with the things in the, pa- in, in, the, in the same way. Your past is clean. You're a new creation in Christ. So if you're still struggling, you're truly not saved. 
because it's very clear in verse 17 here. Notice what he says. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, are you in Christ? You say yes. Okay, very good. Old things have passed away. So you should not be struggling with the same things, according to Paul. Because those are considered old things. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And if it hasn't become new, you're proving to me that you are not born again. You are not saved. You are not a new creature in Christ. How do I know that you're not a new creature in Christ? Because the old things are still new in your life. It's still current. How can you be a new creature in Christ if you're still struggling with the things of the past? I don't see that. I'm not... Uh, as Freddie, I'm not saying that that's what I believe, but that's what someone who holds to a LS position, lordship position, can argue. A reform position can argue. Old things have passed. What, what are you doing struggling with the same thing? What became new in your life? If you're a new, if you're a new creature, what, have, what has become new in your life? Nothing, right? Because you're not really saved. So, I think you guys are confused. Because in my church, everyone there prioritizes church. Everyone there prioritizes their giving. Everyone there is prioritizing their, their involvement because they're a new creature in Christ. They didn't do that before. But the moment they believed in Christ, they, our pastor said, you know what? If you're truly saved then you're going to show that, you're going to evidence that by your life. None of this easy believism stuff, that doesn't work. You believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah, like I heard your pastor tonight, he said, oh, he led someone to Christ. Just believe in Jesus. Ha, yeah, she thinks she's saved, but she's not. Because I expect to see a radically changed life as per 2 Corinthians 5.17. That's what it says. You can't argue with me on that. It says it. It's clear. Right there in verse 17. What are the old things? That's a good question. Because your church is teaching false doctrine. I don't believe in this easy believism. Just believe in Jesus. What do you mean believe in Jesus? It says old things have passed. Old things in the Greek means old. So now you're telling me, oh, well, you know, just believe in Jesus. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in me will not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a license to sin, man. Doesn't James say faith without works is dead? There's got to be works, man. What's your church doing? They're sending, you guys are sending people to hell. All you have to do is believe. Tell me what verse 17 here means. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You probably haven't studied that before because your pastor is evading this. He doesn't want to touch that because now he has to admit that it says old things have passed. What old things have passed? You know, you guys are uh, I, you guys are sincere, but you guys are sincerely wrong, unfortunately. But guess what? You can still believe in Jesus right now. Just come down the aisle, starting with you in the back. Just come forward. Just say, yes, today I'm believing in Jesus. I accept them into my heart. So you have to repent, guys. And then you'll know that you're born again because old things have passed. Old things have passed. It has for me. I'm a new person. Huh? What is what? I'm fine. Old things that on the person themselves. Yeah, I mean, you're a new Christian. Well, yeah, I think old things means old things. Like all your struggles, all your sins. I, I mean. 
Yeah. Sir? Paul says something very similar in the Romans 6. Uh-huh. About the old man where he says, um, therefore we are buried with him to the death. Just as Christ raised him from the dead. Um, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him and the body of sin might be done away with him. I, I, I'm in agreement. Our old man should be crucified with him. Mine it was. That's why I don't struggle anymore. Oh, the power of the sin nature? Okay, well, has the power of the sin nature been broken in your life? It has for me. How do I know that? Well, because I'm living a lifestyle of, for him. My faith without works is dead. I mean, it's, a, it's obvious to me. I mean, you guys just... Young lady, have you, are you a new creation in Christ? You are? Okay. You're with these guys, huh? All right. You guys are all... Sir, son in the back, you young man, are you a new creation in Christ? You are? You're with them? feel sorry for you guys. How about you in the blue shirt back there? All right, well, how do we answer this? Okay, let's see. There's an easy way to explain what Paul is saying here. It's referring to perspective on people. We don't view people the same way anymore as believers in Christ. We look at them as opportunities for salvation, opportunities to win them over for Christ. Take a look at, for example, back up contextually. Therefore, from now on, what does it say, Bill? We recognize. We don't look at people according to the old man, the old flesh, right? Even though we've known Christ like that according to the flesh, yet, yet now we know him thus no longer. Notice the word from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. We don't look at people the way that we used to when we were lost, when we we're still unregenerate. That's just a few verses back before you get to verse 17. Therefore, because of the therefore, we have to ask ourselves, why is the therefore therefore? Well, back up to verse 16. When you take 16 with 17, therefore, <clears throat> in fact, let me go back to 14. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus. That if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all. That those who live should no longer what? For themselves, we should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one. We don't look at anyone according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. We don't look at him like that anymore. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and we are, he is a new creation. Old things. What old things? How we used to view people. Verse 16. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's regarding a perspective on people. It's regarding a, how we view people. It's a perspective on how we view people. We don't view people the way that we used to. Did you not have a way of thinking about certain people prior to conversion? Didn't you look at certain people and say, oh my gosh, look at him, the color of his skin. Look at his nationality. I bet you he is like this. That's viewing people from the old perspective. 
unregenerate. We used to have these biases towards certain people because of the old way. We grew up that way. We used to think a certain way, but now no longer. We don't view people the same way anymore. Thoughts, comments? So it's perspective. Perspective on people. When you take 14 all the way down, in fact, yeah, we could start with 14. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. Let me see if I can use a, a, another translation here so that you can see it. Sometimes when you use a different translation, it makes it easier in some ways to understand it. Let me pull this out. Starting with verse 14. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to old life. This is what Mike was saying earlier in Romans 6. He died for everyone so that those who receive this new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. For them. Verse 15. So, verse 16, we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. You see that? We stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. Unregenerate. At one time we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we now know him. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person the old life is gone, a new life has begun. So now we have to interpret that contextually. So the whole idea here is perspective, how we view people. He died for everyone so that those who receive this new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ. So we stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. Comments, thoughts? You ever see it that way before? That's basically what it's saying here. When you look at it and compare it, especially when you base it on the original text there. I know Mike is drilling through his computer. But the idea here is it's a perspective. When you, to simplify it, it's just we don't view people the way that we used to. It's perspective. Perspective has changed. So now let me take us through... My notes here. A way of salvation. A free grace perspective comparing free grace and reform perspectives on salvation. Beginning with justification. Free grace perspective says, by definition, justification is the act of God declaring a sinner righteous by faith alone in Christ alone. Right? Faith alone in Christ alone. Believe in Christ. The scriptural basis is taken from Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, Romans 3, verse 28. So an example would be a person believes in Jesus Christ and is immediately justified before God, independent of any subsequent works. That's justification, declared righteous. So that's a free grace perspective, understanding when you think of the doctrine of justification or salvation, also known as phase one. So that's justification. Now, however, now when we... Oh, yes? So, what is, what is the... Why is a person justified before righteous? The righteousness of Christ was imputed upon him at faith. Upon faith. And then, we have our first... 2 Corinthians 5, 20, I think. Let me see. Let me pull it up. Yeah, verse 21. You see that, Mike? Verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
So his righteousness has been accredited to us. We receive that when... We're made righteous, correct, at, upon faith in Christ. Um, look at Romans 3.28. Uh, Bill, can you read that? How we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law? Okay, very good. And then verse 24 we see that being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, Romans 3.24 Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We connect that with 521 of 2 Corinthians. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. That in him, that in Christ takes place at the moment of faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. So when a person believes in Christ, he's immediately justified before God. Ephesians 2.8.9, Romans 3.28, 2 Corinthians 5. So that's a free grace perspective there, and it could be, we're now going to contrast that with a reform perspective. This is why it's dangerous. Justification is also by faith alone, but what does it say? True faith. They supply the word true. True faith is is always accompanied by works as what? Evidence. You must have works and that is evidence of your true faith. So true faith will be evidenced by works. Scriptural basis, James 2.17, Galatians 5.6. Let's look at James 2.17. I know we've seen this in the past, but let's see this for the sake of the recording. Those online. James 2.17 says the following. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So what can one say about something that is dead? What can one say about something that is dead? Yeah, what can one say if something is dead? It's, it was once alive. That's very good. But if you look there closely, faith by itself, is there faith? Faith is there. Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So you have faith minus works still is faith. You have faith, works. No works here, but faith here. Do you have faith? Yes. But minus the works, James calls it what? Dead. What does dead mean? Useless. That's all it means, useless. It could, if it is the fruit of the Spirit. But if you're trying to say works must accompany faith to prove salvation, that would go contrary to, that would be contrary to the rest of Scripture that talks about faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Such as in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, John 3, 16, John 6, 47, John 6, 40, a host of other verses, Acts 16, 31, where it talks about simple faith in Him. Of course we want to accompany faith with works. But see, ref, Reformed theology or Reformed perspective wants to argue that the only way you can know 
that you're truly saved is if you have works with it. So that's different from saying we should uh, have good works because we're, we love God. We're lovers of God. He who loves me obeys me. But we, we're going to get caught up in this uh, constantly working, working, working to try to prove salvation. That goes contrary to grace. It's stressful. How many works do you do, have to do to prove that you're finally saved? You can't ever know in Reformed theology because the only way you'll know is at the end of your life. You have to reflect and say, hopefully I did enough. See? So... For a Reformed perspective, a person believes in Jesus Christ, but their, justi their justification is seen as incomplete without visible evidence of works. That's harsh. How are you going to substantiate that? You have to play hoops to get this to work. When the scripture talks about grace... When you have to say a person believes, but you have to have visible evidence of works in order for someone to say you're truly saved, that's, that's not, no longer justification. In fact, I think one of the most powerful arguments to prove contrary to what they're saying is in Romans 4.4. Let's turn there really quickly. One of the most compelling arguments that usually will shatter Reformed theology if you do it correctly, is verse 4 of Romans 4. Can you read that, Mike? Romans 4-4? Mm-hmm. 4-3 four, four. Mm -hmm. and 4-4 four, four, together. Look closely well, at what it's saying. Well, what, the, well, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as praise, but as death. Mm -hmm. And verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him and justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. What do you guys think about that? Pretty strong, I think, right? Compelling? A person, for the recording, uh, those online, Starting with verse 3, Romans 4, 3, all the way to Romans 4, 5. Romans 4, 3 to 5 says the following. Listen closely. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So all he did was believe. He believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Verse 4. Now to him who works, like reform. The wages are not counted as grace, but as a debt. God owes you now. Verse 5. But to him who does not work, but simply, I'm adding the word simply, but believes on him who justifies the what? Who? The ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Isn't that what we said? Isn't that what we read in verse 3? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now when you read verse 5, to the one who does not work but believes on him. Who's him referring to? Jesus Christ. To the person who believes in Jesus Christ who justifies the ungodly, the unregenerate, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Doesn't get any clearer than that. Very powerful, very persuasive. All you have to do is believe you do not have to work. Now, it doesn't mean you can't serve God. It just means when it comes into the, when we talk about the context of righteousness, that's simply by believing in Him. And Him will, will justify the ungodly. We don't have to do anything because it is to telestai. We have to take Jesus Christ at his word. It is finished. All we have to do now, according to verse 5, is to believe. To him who does not work, but believes on him who said to Telestai, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. 
Is there anything here that says you must do works? That it has to, your justification has to be visible with works as, I, as, it defi- as it's defined here in re- reform perspective? Not at all. If Paul wants us to know that without a shadow of a doubt, he would have said, well, you know what? We're saved by faith, but make sure you have works that accompanies the righteousness that you receive upon faith. Does it say that anywhere? No. Why? Because like Dwight Pentecost says in his book, and what I've been saying for the last several years, we should not blur the two. Salvation is simply by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Discipleship is obedience to him. Denying your family and prioritizing God. He who loves father, mother, son, daughter more than me is not worthy to be my disciple. Pretty clear. Those are discipleship passages. That's if you want to follow him and ramp things up as far as your discipleship is concerned. But you can't deny father, mother, son, daughter to say that's how I'm justified. It doesn't say that at all. That means This is how you're a disciple. Discipleship requires commitment. Salvation, soteriology, justification requires faith. Faith in Christ. Clearly in Romans 4, 3 to 5, thunders that loud and clear. And it bothers me because we're so... This is very prominent today where a lot of people just say, Oh, well... I I listened to this pastor on the radio the other day, very persuasive, very dynamic, very charismatic, and he says, if you're truly saved, you must surrender your life, pick up your cross, and follow me. Where does that belong to? That's discipleship. That's exactly what Pentecost was arguing in 1996. Pick up your cross and follow me. Should we pick up our cross and follow Christ? Of course. But that's not salvation. That's discipleship. We can't blur the two. Otherwise, guess what's going to happen? We're going to be confused. We're going to question our salvation. And then we're going to finally say, I can't do this church thing anymore. I can't be a Christian anymore. It's too hard. Yeah, if you, if you look at it like that, it is too hard. God never said to do these things to be saved. The only thing that's required to be saved is Romans 4, 5. To him who does not what? Does not work. That word there, work, is ergon. Work. It's the same word in Revelation 20. They will be judged by their works. They're going to stand there before the judgment seat of, or the great white throne judgment, and their works are going to solidify the reason why they're going to go to the lake of fire. Not because their works were bad, but to show in the face of God that even though they have all these good works, their ergon is going to fall short because they they could have had the righteousness of Christ, but because they did not believe in Him, their their names were not written in the book of life. A person goes to the lake of fire not because they're bad, but because what? Their names are not written in the book of life. That's the sole reason why. How do you get your name written in the book of life? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So, justification, reform perspective, always says, give me evidence of works. True faith is always accompanied by works as what? As evidence. That's confusing. And boy, that does, that, does that really bother me. Because it really destroys grace. Justification differences. Okay, now let's put it together on one page. Here we go. Faith alone versus faith plus works evidence. Free grace holds that faith alone justifies while Reformed theology insists insists that genuine faith will inevitably produce works. Immediate versus progressive assurance. Free grace assures immediate justification, the moment of faith, upon belief, whereas Reformed views assurance as confirmed over time through works. Over time through works. So you have immediate immediate versus progressive assurance, faith alone versus faith plus works evidence. Those two are the differences when we talk about the subject of justification. 
So this is where we differ. And again, I'm not opposed to good works. I think we should have good works because he who, if you love me, obey me. So therefore, we do good works. If you love Christ, obey me, obey him. So let's move on to the next. Sanctification, next category. Sanctification, also known as phase two in the doctrinal churches, also known as phase two or sanctification in the context of salvation. You have the um, first aspect, second aspect. Um, how does Chafee put it? Puts it um, past tense, present tense, future tense. Yeah. So this is present tense salvation or sanctification. So free grace perspective. Definition of sanctification is, in, is the process, free grace position, of spiritual growth and becoming more like Christ, and that's distinct from justification, which is what we studied just prior to this. Scriptural basis, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3, Hebrews 10, 14. An example, a believer may struggle with sin. We all struggle with sin, but is still considered justified. We're still saved. We're still phase one cleared up with Christ alone because we placed our faith in him. We don't ever, ever, ever have to worry about justification because we're past that. We're now focused on sanctification. Sanctification is the journey of overcoming sin through the Holy Spirit. We're growing and advancing in him. Coupled with Bible doctrine, we should see a radical transformation over time. Romans 12, 2, don't be like the world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your life? No, your mind. This, your mind. So sanctification, that's a free grace perspective. We're clear on that, right? It's a process of growth and becoming more like Christ, distinct from justification. So we may struggle from time to time with sin, but we're still justified. Sanctification is the journey of overcoming sin through God the Holy Spirit. So let's look at the reform position. This is how they answer. This is their definition. This is their basis, scriptural basis, and their exa are an example of how they would answer this. Definition, sanctification is inseparable from justification. They're linked. Isn't that what we read with Dwight Pentecost? He says so many people blur the two and they mix them together, they're inseparable from justification. What's another way of saying that? If you're justified, you must show change. That's why this is dangerous. Sanctification is inseparable from justification. It's part of the same salvific process. No, it's not. Justification is separate. You can't blur justification and sanctification as one and the same. It's part, for them, it's part of the same salvific process. Scriptural basis, Philippians 2, 12 to 13, Romans 8, 29. Example, a believer's continual growth in holiness is seen as evidence of their justification. So if you want to prove that you're truly justified, you must have evidence of the fact that you have been justified first. Going through the sanctification, that's part of the process, but if I don't see evidence of your justification, then never mind sanctification. You're not even saved. It's like trying to get an unbeliever to be a good person. So for them, it's irrelevant. You must have evidence of first your justification before we can really talk about sanctification so that's why for definition it's inseparable for them from justification it's part of the same salvific process it's together dangerous so let's put it all in, in one on one page what's the differences well Distinct processes versus unified processes. Free grace treats justification and sanctification as distinct, while Reformed theology sees them as interconnected stages of salvation. Now you have security and struggle versus assurance through progress. 
Free grace provides assurance despite ongoing struggles, whereas Reformed theology links assurance to visible progress in sanctification. Oh, what's that? Yes, sure. So, the Reformed folks, I'm just wondering, so David wrote 40% of the Psalms, something mm-hmm. like that, and I'm guessing he probably wrote half of those Psalms prior to the Bathsheba and Uriah against him. Okay? Right. So, what are they saying about David doing the adultery and the murder of Uriah? That's a good question. I'm not sure how they would answer that, but I, I would venture to say that they would say that he had time to prove his salvation through his allegiance to God after the fact. <laughs> That's right. He didn't have much time, but he that was a they, they would say that that that's a I read that somewhere. Yeah, and they would say that was a particular situation that can't be repeated today. Yeah. So that was a a grace, an expression of grace at that particular moment, never to be repeated today. Yeah, it's very very clever at how they would word that. But yeah, Bill, that's, uh, that's the way I would think they would answer based on what I'm seeing here. That they would say that uh, David has ta- had time to change, otherwise you get, you, would, you get that sense with all his psalms that he would r- write. You can see that there's a change of heart over time, so they would probably think that he, over time, proved his, that he was truly saved. I'll have to dig up and see... That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. They have a lot of difficulty explaining a lot of things here. I, I'm still really disturbed by how they handle these two because this is just pew information. Pew meaning this is stuff that the typical church teaches. And if the pastor is being influenced by Reformed theology, because a lot of pastors today online are Reformed, then uh, unfortunately they're going to lead many of their parishioners astray. Or even if the parishioners are just listening to augment what they're getting from church, it's unfortunate that they're going to hear something that is contrary to God's word. So... Uh, no, no direct links, but, um, no, those are separate. I don't see, I've never read anything that they're related, a covenant and uh, reform. I, w- I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of them are covenant, but, um, I know some of them are also dispensationalists. See, so, no. Yeah, grace. Yeah. But um, I wouldn't be surprised, Mike. If, yeah, because it, there's some dispensationalists that are uh, reformed. So I wouldn't be surprised. My concern is just the, the categories of justification and sanctification because that is confusing for them. And if they're teaching it behind the pulpit, then what more... You know, they're impacting the people who sit under their leadership or their tutelage. So let me see if there's anything else. Okay, glorification, last one. We've got like two minutes left. Free grace perspective on glorification. Glorification is the final step in salvation where believers receive their eternal, sinless state or glorified bodies. Basis for this scriptural basis is 1 Corinthians 15, 52 to 53, as well as Philippians 3, 20 to 21. 
to all believers, regardless of their earthly struggles, will be glorified and perfected in Christ. Right? That's glorification. Simple enough. But how about reformed? Well, glorification is the culmination of the transformative process of salvation. Scriptural basis is Romans 8.30, 1 Thessalonians 4.17. So those who persevere in faith and good works will be glorified. Congratulations. You just have to persevere in faith, good works. Then you'll be glorified. But if not, you've proven that you never really were saved to begin with. So that is 1, 2, and 3. So the differences, let's put them on one sheet here. Unconditional versus perseverance dependent. Unconditional versus perseverance dependent. Free grace asserts all believers will be glorified unconditionally, while Reformed theology links glorification to perseverance in faith and works. So the focus on God's promise versus human responsibility. Free grace emphasizes God's unchanging promise Whereas Reformed theology, as we saw, focuses on what? Human responsibility to persevere. Continue, continue, continue. So those are the differences on one page. So conclusions. As students of free grace theology, it is critical to remember the key doctrine of eternal security. Once a person is justified by faith alone, their salvation is secure regardless of their subsequent actions. This assurance of fa- is foundational to free grace theology and underscores our understanding of God's grace. So by contrasting these perspectives, we can appreciate the simplicity uh, and assurance offered by our position, free grace theology, which emphasizes faith in Christ alone, distinct from works as the sole basis for our salvation. So I don't have the time to go over the eternal security part, but I did print that out for me to to cover. Let me just see if I can read some of it. I had five points. I think this is important. I can always, we can always print this out. If you guys are interested, those online, if you're interested in this, um, I can print this out for you. The key doctrine here is, that I wanted to cover was uh, eternal security. So one, I defined it. Two, I gave you bis- biblical support. Uh, John 10, 28 and 29 is, is the support. Three, I gave a theological explanation, the nature of salvation as a gift. Four, the common object- objections. Let's see. Let me just read that quickly because I think that's important to hear and at least hear some of it, not the whole thing. Some common ob- objections. And responses. Believers cannot lose their salvation. Doesn't this promote careless living? How many times have you heard that before? Isn't that a license to sin? So if if you don't lose your if you can't lose your salvation, doesn't this promote careless living? Response. True understanding of grace leads to gratitude and a transformed life, not licentiousness. Believers, while secure, are called to live in a manner worthy of their calling as per Ephesians 4.1. Additionally, God disciplines those whom he loves, Hebrews 12.6. What about passages that seem to suggest believers can fall away, like in Hebrews 6, 4-6? Well, these passages can be understood in context as warning against apostasy, not a loss of salvation. They highlight the seriousness of faith, but ultimately affirm the security of genuine faith. So, again, these are things that we can't cover tonight, but maybe, let's see if maybe next week I can cover it. Since ne- next week, it's also a, it's, it's a small section. Might be able to cover it next week. The, the way to be salt and light. It's a small section, page 94. Let's see. If that's the case, maybe I can read that. Next week. Yeah, I'll provide it next week. I'll provide uh, eternal security, um, the doctrine of eternal security next week. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let's close in a word of prayer and we'll give God all the gratitude that rightfully belongs to him.
Father, thank you as always for giving us this opportunity to assemble together as believers in Christ. We are grateful for the fact that we understand clearly what free grace means according to your word, according to Bible doctrine. And so, Father, we're not a church that adheres to Reformed theology, but simply free grace theology, which comes out loud and clear when we compare and contrast Scripture along Scripture. It comes out loud and clear that it is by grace alone, not by our efforts, but through your Son, Jesus Christ. And by believing in Him, we can have life everlasting and we can be, have a life empowered through God the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for reminding us through your word tonight that it's not based on how good we are, but it's based on our fellowship with thee and based on the finished work of Jesus Christ, in which we are so grateful for. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. We give you all the glory that rightfully belongs to you. We ask and pray these things in Christ's matchless name. Amen. Bill, we had seven? We had seven tonight? We had six. Okay, so when I said... Okay. Okay. Okay, very good. Thank you. I did. Yeah, I needed it. Oh, uh, today? She's a nice lady. And when she told me she was a...